So let's come to the Word this morning, and um, I, uh, yeah, praise the Lord. I'm excited about this morning's message. I'm excited about what the Holy Spirit is saying to us through this, His Word. Uh, over these last few weeks, it's been quite incredible. Now, I just want to ask you this question. Have you ever looked at someone else and thought to yourself, man, I wish I had your life? Come on, be, be honest, be honest. You know, sometimes we can look at others and we can think, why, why is it that things just seem to keep going well for you? Everything seems to, to go well. You seem to have it all together. And yet other people seem to struggle on week by week, month by month. And uh, why this disparity? What, what, is with, what is with that? Well, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about, about how our Christian life is a journey to fulfill a God-given purpose. You and I have been given a God-given purpose. We've got a reason for being on the planet. It's not just to take up space. It's not just to, uh, just to breathe the air. It's not just to live for ourselves and our own, our own selfish um, goals and things. It's actually a purpose that God has given us. The fact is, God has an awesome life planned for you, a life of great purpose and fulfillment. Do you know, when I think about an awesome life, I think about a fulfilling life. I don't think about having millions and millions of dollars necessarily or big flash, this, that, or anything else. I think about a fulfilling life. I think about a life that actually means something and that when I get to the end of it, I go, man, that was a good life. Uh, so you know, when we're defining a, a, a good life, that's what I'm talking about. But this life is not just going to happen automatically, church. It's not just going to happen without you taking some active participation with God in it. He, want, he calls you to participate with him to live that life. So this morning I want to share some practical keys about how you can participate with the Holy Spirit in living the awesome life that he's planned for you in a message I've called Living the Dream. So if you're taking notes, and I really would encourage you to do that, there's the title of the message this morning, Living the Dream. Practical keys to uh, living the life that God has called you to live. Now how many people have watched that program on TV, Hoarders? How many have seen Hoarders on TV? Isn't it, it's just incredible, isn't it? To think that, that people can, can, uh, can hoard so much stuff to the point of endangering their health and endangering the health of their family around them, and yet they can't see what the problem is. It's like no matter how much someone tries to convince them this is not a healthy way to live, you've got to do something about it, they just can't seem to get it. They don't seem to, to understand what, what people are trying to say. Something I've discovered is that telling people that they need to change and even telling them how they need to change and what they need to change generally doesn't work. I've just, I found that. I've worked with people for, I've been pastoring now for, this is my 24th year of pastoring and you guys are going, wow, without that beard, Russell, you only look 24. <laughs> anyway, I, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe a few more years on than that. But, uh, but I found over, these, over those years that when you, when you try and, because, you know, as a pastor and a, and a people helper, you want to tell people. You can see what they need to do to change. So you want to tell them, do this. And I found usually that doesn't work. In fact, often it has the opposite effect. It's like it doesn't motivate people to change. Sometimes it motivates them to retrench and, and go even worse. You think, what, what is the answer here? So telling people doesn't doesn't work. They have to arrive at it themselves. Friend, when you and I arrive at the needs of, of change in our own lives, then something happens. And I think the Holy Spirit is a part of that as well. You know, when the, it's amazing what, uh, you know, God can say stuff I can't say. You know, I come along and tell somebody something and they don't get it, but then suddenly God gives them a dream or something and then they do it. So God, I told them that. What made the difference? Oh, maybe it's because he's God. <laughs> maybe that's it. But the, but the Holy Spirit is able to work in us when we give him the opportunity to speak. So this morning, I, I want to share some real practical ways in which you can create an environment in your life for the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to you about the issues that might be holding you back, those harnesses that Sarah spoke about before. Sometimes we can be aware that something's holding us back, but we don't know what it is. And we don't take the time to actually search. We don't take the time to listen and to, and to pray it through or whatever. So this morning, I want to share some practical keys about how we can get that done. You know, I, I think about the story of the prodigal son as a great illustration of this point I've, been, I've just been making. And that was this, this young man. He, he, uh, 
decided he wanted to take his, you know, half of his inheritance and go off and just waste it on wasteful living. And his father knew that wasn't a good plan. But his father gave him the money anyway. And I think to myself, God, you know, is this, is, is this a, a good example of parenting or not? This is like, who would do that? Well, I'd say probably at the background of it, the father would have had some time trying to convince the son not to do this, but he could see the son was set on doing it anyway. And so to tell him to change, to tell him wasn't going to work. So he gave him half of his inheritance. The son went out and wasted it. But friends, it wasn't until he was in that pigsty, in that place of, of, of despair and reflection that the Bible says, and he came to himself. In other words, the thought dawned on him. He reflected and he came to himself and said, what am I doing? I've got to go back to my father and put things right and, and get things amended. And maybe, just maybe, I might find some grace. And so in that place of reflection, the son was able to get the change in his own heart uh, happening that he needed to happen. Now let's come to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1b, the second half of this verse. This is kind of my, my um, scripture that I want to build on th this morning. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Stripping off every unnecessary weight and the sin that so easily and cleverly entangles us, let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us. Friends, I want to tell you there is a race set before you. There is a purpose. There is a direction that God has given you. But in order for you and I to run that race, we've got to get rid of some stuff. We've got to get rid of some unnecessary weights. We've got to identify what those things are so that we can get rid of them. those harnesses. I loved what Sarah said. That Shira, Sarah said. Man, I've, oh gosh, it must be too early in the year or something. Sarah said. I love what Sarah said about the harnesses because they're those unnecessary weights. Now, last week, I... Um, I spend a bit of time decluttering my office. How many, how many have a drawer in your home that just won't close properly because it's just jammed up with junk? You know what I'm talking about? We've got a drawer like that at home under the telephone. You know, how many got a drawer like we've got under the telephone that's just full of bits and pieces and you, got, you open it up to get a pen out of something and then you can't close it or you can't open it because something's jamming up on the inside and you think, one day, one day, I'll sort that out. Well, I had a, a drawer like that in my office. And um, just on Wednesday morning, actually, just gone, I, I, uh, I battled with this drawer one last time. And I decided, drawer, you're getting sorted out. I'm going to sort you out. Do you know, when I started sifting through that drawer and my, all my, my desk side drawers, I found stuff dating back to 2008 in there. And I'm talking about not stuff I needed to hang on to, just junk. Just like, what? what is papers from 2008 doing in my drawer? I'll tell you what they're doing in my drawer. I haven't had a sort out for a while. That's the problem. In fact, I, I've got this um, container uh, full of pens. It's got lots of pens in it. It's got pencils and rubbers and whiteboard markers and screwdrivers and uh, all sorts of bits and pieces. And, and that container was so full that it would stop the drawer closing properly. So I decided to have a clear out. And do you know what I discovered? I discovered that about a third of those pens in that, in that container didn't work. So, you know, so I pulled them out, tried out, no, bin, try it, bin, bin, oh, that one works, put that aside, bin, bin, like a third, why am I hanging on to pens that don't go? You know, they, and, and what's more, they're actually making my life difficult, because I can't shut the drawer properly. What, why, why? Just because I haven't taken the time to sort things out. I haven't taken the time to deal with them. It's as simple as that. It actually didn't take me long, but I had to step aside from the other things I was doing in order to sort out my drawer. I hope you're starting to make a bit of a connection as to where I might be going. You see, I want to ask this question. Why do we not take the time to declutter our lives? Why don't we take the time to sit down and actually have a think, what is causing the drawers in my life to jam? Because I'm sick of it. I want life to be different. What's causing us to do that? I'll tell you why we don't do this, because we get so consumed with the urgent that we fail to give attention to the important. Have you ever heard that before? It was a bit of a little buzz phrase a number of years ago. You, got, you know, you've got to leave the urgent to give, give time to the important, but we fail to do that. There's, there's so many things demanding your attention. 
And, they, 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 and in fact, with today's technology, there's more demanding your attention than ever because you're sitting down trying to do something quiet. Next thing, that familiar bing on your phone. And you just have to have a look, don't you? You just got to have a look. Who's messaged me? Who's just posted something on Facebook that I don't want to miss out on? You know, what, what do they call that when you don't want to miss out on stuff? FOMO. Don't want to, don't want, you know, scared of FOMO. Fear of missing out. And so there's so many things that are demanding your attention. There's so many urgent things. But I want to tell you, church, they're not as, they're not as important as the important things. Now, the important things won't demand your attention unless the drawer just won't close and say, no, that's it, I'm chock-a-block, you've got to sort me out now. But usually, usually the urgent things are what we give away our attention to and the important things we just put them aside, like reflection, where am I going in life, what's happening, what, what, what's happening in my family, what's happening in my work situation, how, how am I personally? These are the important things that we must give attention to. Now, when I was, when I was sorting out my, my drawer, yes, I had other things to do. I had pressing things. I had a message to prepare for Sunday. Little did I realize that this, <laughs> this uh, activity I was about to engage in was going to give me some great illustration for the message. But I had things to do. I had emails to check. There was urgent stuff. There were things that were needing my attention. I had a lot of pressing things, but I realized that it was time to do something about the clutter. And it's in the same way, there are things that we carry around in our life that are unnecessary, and all they do is weigh us down, making the journey harder. But unless you take the time to identify them, unless you take the time to process them and get a plan to, toward binning those things, they will just continue to make life harder and harder, and they'll build They'll build. You're hearing me this morning. Yeah. See, I would, um, I would put things like worry into that category. I think sometimes we carry worry around and we just don't need to. Other things that could be considered unnecessary weights are procrastination, putting things off, negativity, legalism, unhelpful friendships, overactivity. I've just named a few things here. There's numerous things that could be up on that screen. Well, some of them are only just on the screen, aren't they? Anyway, overactivity. Let me just talk about that for a second. See, I, I think that sometimes we just need to prioritize what we'll do with our time rather than just doing everything that comes along. Some of us, we don't really have a filter to filter out the things that, that we shouldn't be doing. What I've discovered is that there's certain things that come my way to do that I'm really good at doing because I'm gifted in that way. That's my, it's, it's in keeping with the way God has wired me and gifted me. So I just want to lean into those things because those things I get the best use of my time on rather than just getting caught up in everything. Some of us, just we just do everything because we don't know how to say no. We, just, we love to say yes to things and we wind up being cluttered with overactivity. Friends, can I suggest that 2018 is a good year to decide we're going to unclutter this drawer of overactivity? That, you know, in fact, here in Church Life, we, we've actually created a policy. I hadn't planned on saying this, but we've created a bit of a policy where we are trying to encourage people not to have more than one ministry involvement that you are involved in doing, you know, ministry involvement in church uh, during the week. And, and when it comes to what you do on Sundays, not having more than one ministry involvement on a Sunday. Because what happens is we can have people who are just so eager and keen, they're a host on one Sunday, and then the next Sunday they're a singer, and then the Sunday after that they're out with children's ministry, and then the Sunday after that they're helping with creche or they're doing media or something like that, and it's like, it's too much. And they wind up not doing any of those jobs very well. And, and what happens if they forget that their name's on the roster one day? Wow, it's, everything falls apart because we're relying upon them. Or what happens if accidentally their name appears on two rosters at the same time? Sometimes it happens. We're trying to get systems in church life to help avoid that. But one of the ways we can do it is if we just encourage people, hey, just have one ministry involvement in keeping with your gift and lean into that and make it, make it go good. And then maybe something, something, you know, one thing during the week you know, that, that you can really put yourself, pull yourself into. So trying to help people with, with this overactivity thing. But, but we've also got to be our own gatekeeper, don't we? We've got to be our own gatekeeper and decide, this is what God has called me to. This is what I'm going to be involved in. Now, our, our scripture said, um, cast off every 
weight that entangles. But it also talks about the fact that there is, uh, sorry, every weight, every unnecessary weight. But it talks about the fact that there is sin that entangles. This isn't just an unnecessary weight that slows you down, but it's an entanglement that trips you up. This includes things like, and just for just some random things like lust, lying and dishonesty, envy and jealousy, unforgiveness, greed, selfishness. In fact, anything that, that is a contradiction to a, ho- a life of holiness, as the Bible teaches us. Friends, sin won't just be an unnecessary weight in your life. It'll actually be a snare. It'll be something that takes you off on a tangent. It won't just make life more difficult. It'll make life impossible. It'll take you off on another pathway from the one that you need to be on. It traps and ensnares you so that you can't see clearly. You can't hear God's voice clearly. And you can't make healthy decisions. Church, we need to take stock of what's going on in our lives. Don't just live with it. Don't just live with that, that, that nagging temptation. Don't just live with that issue that you just don't seem to be able to get a handle on. Get a plan around it. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, he actually set you free from slavery to sin. Do you realize that? It's just a fact. It's not something that you feel or whatever. It's just a fact. When Jesus paid, paid with his own blood on the cross, he actually set you free from sin slavery so that you can walk free from it. So get a plan around it. Make a decision this year. I'm not going to put up with these things in my life anymore. So where do we start with this? Where do you start with all of this? See, I, I think the beginning of the year is a really, really great time to begin to put some action into it. We need to take time to reflect on our lives, and we need to make some decisions about what stays and what needs to go. Then we need to determine some positive action to take a, a, a to. Uh, to take that will help us progress in this journey of life and godly purpose. You and I need to actively do something about this. So where do we start? Well, firstly, we need to identify the draws that need to be sorted out. What are the draws in your life that you're struggling with? What are the draws that are is struggling to shut? What are, the, what are the issues going on for you? Are there relationships that have become tense and uneasy? See, sometimes this happens. We, we get these, you know, relationships just become uneasy. And, and uh, rather than take the time to sort it out, we just live with it. But then Christmas comes around, and you're going to see these ones again if they're family members, you know, or, or work. You're going to be facing them every day at work. Hey, Sarah. Yeah, no, that's all right. We're, we're all good, eh? And um, so Sarah's in the office. She's one of our pastors. And, uh, you know, but there's, there's things that, that, um, that, you know, tensions and things that come into relationships, and we need to do something about them. Are there areas of your life that are frustrating? Well, these are the areas, these are the drawers you start with. Now, several years ago, I developed a tool to to help with this process, to help people reflect on important areas of their life. In fact, I I actually developed the tool for myself uh, because I realized that uh, I needed to take some time on a regular basis just to have a good inventory of my life and have a look at um, the various areas and ask myself some pertinent questions. You know, is this area healthy? What changes do I need to make? And so as I I, um, did this, as I developed, this tool. It helped me identify growth areas in my life. Now, I call them growth areas and not problems for a reason. See, I don't think you and I need to be aware of any more problems. There's enough problems in the world. There's enough problems around for you to go, oh, now I've got a load of problems. No, you just got growth areas. See, sometimes we call them weaknesses too. I don't even like that term. I think growth areas is far better because it puts it into a positive light. This is an area that I need to grow in. It also gives you a sense of hope. It's not just a problem that you're always going to have. It's a growth area that you're going to grow out of, you know? And so I developed this tool to help me work out what the growth areas were in my life. And then I made it available to others as well. Many of our leaders, some of our leaders, I should say, have used this tool, and it's been of real benefit to them. And you can find this on our app, actually. I uploaded it to our app um, a year or so ago under the resources button, and it's called Personal Reflection and Goal Setting. And it is a brilliant, just a one and a bit page tool that will help you identify the drawers that are jamming and help you identify some positive action that you can take. Does this sound good this morning? I mean, I mean, let me ask you a straight up question. How many people just want to sit in life and stay the same and stay where you are? 
my hand's actually not up. All right, I know it's up, but you know, I just want to catch someone out. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I asked a question in reverse like that, and someone's hand, one of our life group leaders, their hand shot up like this. Oh. <laughs> How many people want to move on? want to make some positive change, want to grow. Friends, I'll tell you what, this is what we're about. And as a church, this is part of our culture. We're not the kind of church that just wants to sit and just waste space. We're here to make some positive change, beginning with ourselves. Because I realize that the most positive change I can make out there begins with the positive change I make in here. It's no good trying to go and fix everybody else's growth areas. I almost called them problems, growth areas, until I've done a bit of growing myself. So we need to focus on our own lives. So I've developed this tool to help us, and I want to just take us through it now. Um, and just, just have a bit of a look at it, because it's a great place for you to start. The first uh, thing, or just let me just talk about it uh, briefly. Here's how it works. Personal reflection and goal setting. What you do is you set aside some time, perhaps a day if you can afford it, or if you can't afford a whole day, maybe something like half an hour each morning over, over several days. And you prayerfully read through the, the questions that this, um, this tool asks, and you uh, think about some of the key areas of your life, how you're doing, how you might need to change, and you write down your responses to each of those questions. And then when you've done that, you set a few little goals, maybe three or four, maybe five goals for each area for, for the next 12 months. So out of, your, out of the uh, responses that you've given to these questions, you decide, hey, I'm going to change in this area, or I'm going to start doing that, you know, and uh, make them so that they're, how many people have heard of SMART goals? When you write a goal, it's got to be, now this is going to be testing, isn't it? It's got to be specific, measurable, so you can actually tell whether you've achieved it or not. It's got to be, what's the next letter? A, a achievable, R, realistic, and T, timed. Put a time limit on it. Give it 12 months. Maybe give it three months and measure it in three months' time. That's a smart goal. Okay, so what are some of the areas that I've got on this tool? And remember, I set this up for myself primarily. There might be some other drawers in your life that you'd like to put some questions around, but these are the ones that I felt I really needed to focus in on. The first one is my personal life. How is my personal life doing? Uh, first question there regarding my personal life is what state do I feel I'm in right now? Am I peaceful? Am I stressed? Am I tired? Do I feel fit and healthy? Am I in a rut? Am I progressing? Ask yourself some of these questions. Now, I haven't got those particular bits up on the screen because there wasn't room on the slide, but if you download this, um, this resource from our app, you'll find all those other little questions there as well. How are you feeling? Are you feeling stressed? You see, sometimes we are feeling stressed, but we're not taking the time to identify it. And I, and I hear so many people say that these days, oh, I'm so stressed out. How many? You hear that? Maybe you've said it this week even. I'm so stressed out. Well, if that's the case... Let's have a look, look at our lives and ask the question why. Because I believe, friends, I believe that God has given you enough time to do what you need to do. Seriously. I think maybe some of us need to set a little goal and start telling ourselves this year, I have enough time to do what God has called me to do. And if I'm running around saying, I haven't got enough time, I haven't got enough time, I haven't got enough time, what is there in your life that God has not called you to do that's chewing up your time and jamming up the drawer? You hearing me this morning? See, I, I believe that God, why would God call you and I to live a life and not given us enough time to do what he's called us to do in that life? He has given you enough time. He's given you the ability to live a peaceful life. Jesus, actually the Bible says Jesus is the Prince of Peace and, he, and one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is peace. So ask yourself, am I feeling peaceful? Am I tired? Am I fit and healthy or not? And write down some responses to that. The second one is, uh, second question is, how connected to God am I feeling? That's a really, really good question to ask ourselves. Sometimes we, we drift. You know, I found, and I've mentioned this, said this before, people don't drift toward God. They only drift away from God. You know, we drift out of relationship with God, not toward God. When you, your relationship with God requires a bit of uh, participation and action on your part. So ask yourself the question, Am I feeling connected with God or not? Don't just wait until you're way down the track so far you can't even, you don't even know where God is anymore and say, well, God must have left me. No, you, you, you drifted from him. 
The third question there is, how fulfilled am I feeling? I wonder when the last time was you asked yourself that question. How fulfilled in life am I feeling? Oftentimes we don't, we wait until we're about 50 before we ask the question, oh gosh, I'm 50 next year, that's scary. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to ask that question before I turn 50. We, some, you know, oftentimes people have this midlife crisis and go, you know what, the last 50 years haven't been very fulfilling. Well, I suggest ask yourself that question long before you get there. And if you're already there and beyond there, ask yourself that question regularly now, eh, Jenny? Ask yourself that question. How fulfilled am I feeling? Because I believe that God has called you and I to live a fulfilling life. When you're, look, when you're engaging with his purpose for you, and when you're flowing in the gifts that he's given you, life is amazingly, incredibly fulfilling. And, uh, and I'll tell you, it, it, it's the answer to looking at someone else's life going, I wish I had your life. You know, jealousy about what other people's lot and stuff. Because you're living your life. They've got a different life. I look at some other people's life and I'm thinking, man, I'm glad I haven't got your life. Because God has not gifted me to do the things you do. In fact, when I see you doing what you're doing, I love that you're doing it passionately and everything. And I say, go for it. And I'm not going to come and join you in that because God has not gifted me that way. Yeah. It's a great day when you can say that. Some people look at other people's lives and go, I wish I had their gifts. I wish, God, oh God, I want to do what they do. No, just find your own groove. Find your own gifts. You have them. You have them. And I think that, um, that this tool that we're talking about right now is a really, really great way for you to start to pursue it. Amen? So here's the next question. How do I feel when I think about the future? That's a really probing question. Am I anticipating, am I looking to the future with anticipation or am I fearful of the future or, I do, or do I not even consider the future? Friends, we need to be looking forward with a sense of anticipation. How do I feel? And be honest about it. If you, if you feel worried about the future, write that down because right there, there's a growth area. There's something you need to get a bit of, bit of action around. The next question there, what are some growth areas I can see in my life? After you've asked all those other questions, you'll be able to see some. What are some things that I would like to achieve in my life? I wonder when the last time you, it was that you asked yourself that question. What are some things I'd like to achieve in my life? I remember a number of years ago, um, um, Andrea and I, when our family were a lot younger, uh, every year we travel away to somewhere in the country to our national conference. Uh, last year it was down in, in, in uh, Lower Hutt. Uh, for a period of, of a few years it was up in Tauranga, which was just an amazing place to go for the national conference And because uh, you get a bit of time in the afternoons. And so we'd go walking along the, the beach at the mount. And I remember, this was quite a number of years ago, we were walking along the beach and the thought struck us that uh, we had our family living at home for the next 10 years, a minimum of the next, uh, probably maximum, minimum, sorry, of the next 10 years before they started leaving home. And so what were some things that we really wanted to achieve within those 10 years? And so we set some goals and we, we made a commitment, let's pursue these things. It included things like we wanted to go for a family holiday down South Island and we wanted to do this and we wanted to do that and a few other things over those years. And you know, most of those things we achieved only because we took time to identify them. What is it that you want to achieve? What is it that you believe God's put in your heart to achieve? Take some time to think about it. Hey, who's feeling like this is a good thing to do? Yep. Some people might be going, no, nah, goal setting, nah, got all that at whatever work. You know, maybe you had to do a, a, a mandatory seminar at work on goal setting and it was boring as. Now we're getting it in church. I'll tell you, there's a reason. Because if you fail, <laughs> good on you, Judy. If you fail, what did, what did ben, Benjamin Franklin say? He who fails to plan, plans to fail. You've got to plan. You've got to do this. Now at the beginning of the year is a great time to do it. Let's move on a, a lot more quickly now through the rest. Oh, sorry, before we do, set some goals around some of those growth areas. Four or five goals. And, and determine I'm going to do this over the next 12 months. Relationship. Here's another great, great area. If you're in a relationship, particularly if you're married, and if you're not married, maybe then a, a goal, if you're living in a, in a relationship where you're not married, a great goal is to get married. 
a great goal because you see marriage builds around your relationship a sense of covenant a sense of we're committed to one another now I'm not here to judge anybody that's that's not married but I just really you know as a church we believe in marriage we believe in and not just um, not just the institution but the preparation that goes with it to help people stay the course it's an important thing but in your relationship ask yourself this question what is the honest state of my relationship right now oh man Russell you just dropped the r-bomb right there the relationship bomb is it good is it struggling is it honest and open is it fresh is it stale I'm serious ask yourself these questions and be willing to be honest with the answers because unless you reckon with it it'll only stay that way if it's less than what it needs to be if it's great write that down too that's something to celebrate uh, ask, you, ask this question, how well do my partner and I relate? Are we relating well? Are we getting to know one another better as time goes on? Or are we just kind of drifting and living two separate lives? Are we growing more in love as time goes on? See, I, I believe, I uh, heard Pastor Sue say this actually at a wedding recently, but your wedding day should be the worst day of your marriage. Really? Yeah, because it should just get better and better and better from then on, you know. That doesn't mean to say you don't have your moments. We all have our moments, don't we? Uh, we're not going to talk about those right now, but we all have our moments. But I believe it's God's design that we grow more in love, just like he calls us to grow more in love with him. He, God wants us to become more and more connected to him. He, he's designed marriages like that too, that we grow more and more connected. So ask yourself, how are we doing in that area? Um, what are some growth areas in my relationship? Set some goals. It might be that we're going to have a date night once a month or, or it might be some, something, some, something else. I don't know. Whatever the, your goal might be. Okay, the next area, moving through more quickly now, family. What is the honest state of my family right now? How connected are we relationally? Are, there, are the needs of each family member being met? You might be looking at some of these questions and you think, oh man, I don't know if I like the answer to that question. Friend, you're not going to change unless you reckon with that negative answer. Reckon with it. Prayerfully think about that and what can I do? Holy Spirit, what can I do to bring a change in that area? Where do I feel each family member is at? Write the names of your, of your kids down. Write the, your husband or your wife. Write your, the, the names of your family if, or your brothers and sisters if you not, not, don't have your own married family. And, and write them down and, and ask yourself the question, where are each of them at? Um, um, how are they doing? How do, how do I perceive them? And then lastly, what are some growth areas in my family? What are some things that we can grow in? What are some things that we, we need to do or we need to pursue as a family? Fourthly, ministry. I talked before about, about uh, people being involved in ministry. Now, let me just qualify this. I wrote this for myself and then particularly for my leaders in church here. Uh, but I believe that God has called every one of us to have a ministry of some sort. See, God has called and anointed you with, with uh, special abilities to be able to touch somebody's life in some way. Don't ever think that ministry is just for people who kind of get up the front and, and play guitars and things or lead home groups or whatever. Ministry is for all of us. And so, um, so ask yourself the question, what is the honest state of my ministry right now? Do I have one? Do I have some way in which I'm helping other people and, uh, and using the gifts that God's put in my life? Do I feel like ministry is, my ministry is progressing, remaining stagnant or regressing? Ask yourself that question. Do I feel suitably equipped for the ministry that I'm currently involved in? Maybe there's a growth area there that you need to learn, learn a bit more stuff or, or get a bit of training or something. What are some areas of growth I have in my ministry and what are areas of my ministry, uh, what areas of my ministry need investment in? Great, poignant questions. Set some goals around those. And then the last one. Now the last one you might think, what on earth? Why, what's that about? We could bring up the next slide, please. Finances. Do you realize that, that finances are a huge part of your life? And, and they are probably one of the biggest causes of stress in marriages, apart from the other two things, which are communication and sex. We're talking about finances today. Don't get too excited. <laughs> I could see people go, whoa, ears are going red. <laughs> 
But hey, we're talking about finances. And, and, and finances are so important. Um, a number, let me just share a little testimony. A number of years ago, I mean, Andrew and I have always um, lived frugally. You know, we were just counting, <laughs> recalling some stories the other night about just how frugally uh, we have lived over the years, but how God has blessed that. And, and uh, what, what do I mean by frugally? Do people know what frugally means? It means to, you know, don't just live lavishly. Just, uh, you know, be careful with how you spend and use your money. We've always lived that way, and uh, we've always honored God with our finances and giving and, and tithing and all that sort of thing. But about probably maybe eight or nine years ago, um, and uh, our finances started to run backwards. And, uh, and really, it was, it was the change in, in life that we were facing, the family were growing up, expenses and all of that. Uh, but I began to realize, man, we need a way to control our finances so that this doesn't get away on us. This is like a, a runaway train right now, and we need to put some controls. And so I set a goal to uh, really uh, create some sort of way that I could budget. Oh, there's the B-bomb right there. How many love that word, Budget. Oh, but I'll tell you what, you need it. We need, we've given, we've given so much resource and we are the stewards of that resource and, and if we don't control it, it will control us. I see so many people today being controlled by money. Do you realize there's a spirit behind that? There's a mammon spirit behind that that wants to, to shut you down in that area of finance so that you can't do this sort of thing? And so that you can't be involved and so much of what we're involved in ministry around the world requires money. Uh, missionaries don't just live on fresh air and the smell of an oily rag, you know. Things, you know, and, and church doesn't run without people committed to the, the principles of tithing and so on. And so, but in order to shake yourself free of, of the control of finances, sometimes we just got to open that drawer and sort it out. Get it unjamming. And so, so I uh, created this. Uh, the Lord enabled me, really, to uh, come up with a plan, a way of managing my finances. And over the years, we've included that same plan in our discipleship material here at Salt. And over the years, we've, we've helped a lot of people get their finances sorted out. But that's an area that, uh, that we need to give attention to. Do I feel like my finances are in order and under control? Am I feeling content with my current budget? Do I even have a budget? Do I have a clear picture of where I want to be financially? This is one actually that, that we all need to give regular attention to because you don't think about retirement when you're 35. Well, maybe you do, but I know a lot of people don't. And we need to be thinking about the future. Am I happy with my goals? Um, am I content with my goals five years, 10 years, and 20 years' time right through to retirement? Am I happy with these goals and are they taking me where I need to go? And then the last question is, are there changes I need to make to my finances? I tell you, as I said before, if you don't control your finances, they'll control you. And I don't believe that God's called us to be shackled with any harness of slavery, as Sarah said this morning, including finances. I just kind of feel right now as I'm talking about this that this is really hitting the mark for a lot of people. And, uh, my, my, you know, this is one of the frustrations of preaching, actually, is uh, I'll come to the end of my message and I'm done. Now it's all in your hands, you know? And sometimes I wish a bit more was in my hands, but I know that telling people what they need to do doesn't work. It's got to come down to a point of reflection and a point of inner, inner um, decision-making on, on your part and on my part for me. And so this morning, I wonder how we're doing in these areas. I think something that would actually take this whole thing up a notch is if you were to find someone else, once you've gone through this process and you've set some goals, if you could find another person to keep you accountable with these goals, that would take it up another notch. That would be just huge. So I'll just leave that thought with you. Um, you know, I've presented an opportunity here to, to uh, address some things, and I just think uh, what a great thing to do. So in conclusion this morning, taking time to reflect on your life is about being proactive rather than reactive. It's about putting your headlights on full beam. I've used that analogy a number of times lately. It's about putting your headlights on full beam and looking further up the road. It's about asking yourself, is my life heading in a positive direction or is it just drifting? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or for anyone to stand up right now, but ask yourself that question. Is my life going somewhere or is it just drifting? Friends, I want to tell you the most empowering thing you'll ever hear. It's in your hands to do something about it. Don't blame the government. 
Don't blame your parents or the teachers at school or the other kids. Don't blame your children. Don't blame your husband or definitely don't blame your wife. That's, um, if you do that, men, you're in trouble. <laughs> Just ask yourself the question, am I drifting? I can do something about it with the help of the Holy Spirit. So the challenge this morning, make a decision to live the dream. Don't settle for drifting along. Don't settle for clutter. Take some positive action and see the dream life, a life of fulfilling your God-given destiny, become a reality. Is that a good message this morning? What a great way to look at the coming year. Father, we just thank you for the challenge today. And God, I pray that, Lord God, as I close off this, this message and, and kind of leave it for people just to think about and mull on, myself included, Lord, because this applies to me as much as everybody else. In fact, Lord, I've already made the commitment this week to go through this process again myself. Lord, to take that time just to ask myself all these questions and look at all these, these things and set some new goals for the year. Father, I pray that we as a church would do this together. Lord, that it will become part of our culture that we're heading on, heading in a direction together. We're encouraging one another to be purposeful and proactive because, Lord, I believe that that's what you've called us to be. Father, we thank you for the challenge today in Jesus' name.